Yeah. My name is Renisha, like you said already, Renisha Chand. Um, I come from Fiji. I migrated to New Zealand in um, 2014. Yeah, and I'm considered one of the strong feminists in the community. So uh, my grand nana, she is amazing, her cooking skills are amazing and I heard that this masala recipe was passed from her nana, so it's coming down from a lot generation, so my mum now passed it on to me, so all this masala that I, the one that you're drinking right now, um, is made from the masala tea that I make myself and my mom taught me how to make it and my mom's mom taught her to make it so it's like passed on all this generation and i think that's the way we sort of keep the memories and keep our ancestors um present and something that we have so yeah, yeah. hi i'm renee i'm a writer uh, and i like to cook and i have um two children who like to eat <laughs> i was one of the tutors on uh, a amazing workshop called Mind Feast, which ran in 2018. And this was a group of women, migrant women, who came together with the food and stories from their homelands um, for, um, I think it was four sessions. And, um, and it was basically an afternoon of sharing and fun, but also quite a lot of really earnest discussion about um, issues that affect all of us. Um, and, and also a lot of writing. So I was the writer that uh, ran the writing exercises and out of that came a lot of quite brilliant and insightful writing. Um, my name is John Rata and I'm a Filipino creative artist based here in Auckland, New Zealand. The Filipino dishes I like the most are, of course, um, chicken adobo, that's really nice. Um, there's also something called kare kare which is sort of like a type of um, stew with meat and vegetables where the sort of sauce is um, heavily infused with peanut butter. Hi, my name is Salah. Paradise is run by family business. It's our family business. And we are running this business last from 10 years. My culture, food means and represents um, history. Um, just because in Filipino cuisine has had so many influences um, branching off of um, Spanish cuisine which was the first um, people that came and colonized the Philippines so there's a lot of influences between different um, cultures that have actually come to the country and influenced um, the food itself so that includes Spanish um, Spanish influences, American influences, um, some from China as well. I'll explain you about our signature dish. We call biryani, biryani chicken, biryani lamb, biryani veg. So we got uh, specialized pots uh, which we bring from India. We brought from India, very like uh, it's made for only for the biryani to make uh, big pots, no height, small height. And uh, I'll explain you how we make uh, the biryani. Like um, if you are making the lamb biryani, what we do, we mix the lamb a day before. And uh, when we next day, we cook the biryani, like we soak the rice for a few hours and uh, we cook the rice uh, like a half done rice uh, and uh, we on top of the we put the rice on top of the lamb and we seal the pot and we put like high flame slow flame it takes around 45 minutes to, be, uh, to make the biryani and we don't open the biryani in between like to see like it's cooked or not but uh, with the smoke only we will know it's cooked or not so so like when we open it should be perfectly done so that's the it's not easy to make this type of biryani we should have good experience to make this dumb style biryani dumb style means slow cooked biryani mm. yeah that's how we make the biryani and it's very popular this is our signature dish and uh, i think uh, now people are liking compared to butter chicken the biryani we are selling a lot I've been asked about fusion food and I have to say that in New Zealand I tend to avoid fusion restaurants 
the reason for that is that they they're a little bit unless I know who's behind them they can be a little bit dodgy so fusion might mean somebody traveled to Thailand and thought the food was cool so they went home and tried to make it um, with local ingredients and in some ways I'm a little bit um, I feel always a little bit cynical about chefs that are not from that culture trying to emulate that culture and then branding the restaurants I think uh, if you haven't really spent a lot of time deeply immersed in the culture and understanding the food, how food relates to that culture, I don't know how you can really present that food with great authenticity. How do you feel when a white restaurant sell Indian food at higher prices? <sighs> hmm. What do you think? Like. Uh Okay, if it's higher prices also, it should, what I think, it should, be, it should be authentic food. Do you think people are enjoying that uh, changing chai into something different and telling chai? The chai is different, you know, it's very popular in India. You know, when we, after the, normally, you know, we have the tea after the, after the food. Yeah. And here people, you know, in breakfast, lunch, everywhere. Every time, you know, whenever they want, they will have the coffee, not the chai. But see, depend how they are liking. I don't think so. The chai which we make in India, they are making here, is different style. We boil milk few hours. Mm. And here, you know, just within two minutes, microwave and put some tea bag and uh, giving there. It's like, it's not... A Chai. Chai, we boil the, uh, the tea separate and uh, milk separate for a long time and then we mix and then we serve. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, okay, it's weird. You know, like normally when we are referred to curry munches, it comes from the fact that we're using curry powder, we're using turmeric in our food, you know? And now those same curry munches are sort of like putting you know, turmeric in a tea or in a latte and using it as like turmeric latte. I'm like, be either side of, you know, like rather stop calling us her munches or stop drinking those lattes. I don't have anything against them, it's just the fact that people just make their own alternatives and it's a bit weird to see one way you're supporting it and the other way you're discriminating it. In New Zealand, I think there's really been a rash of, of people um, like making uh, like thinking they can make res make um, Asian food and so th for some reason Asian street food is really trendy except that I think when you make really bad dumplings with weird fillings and then you sell them for like ten dollars for three or whatever it is that um, yeah I think it's it's not cool um, I think that I mean I think sharing food uh, from a culture so if you came to my house probably one of the first things I'd do is uh, offer you some food and um, if if I thought that you liked it I would offer you um, bao or, um, or dumplings or something like that but that's because it's my culture it's part of my hospitality culture and it's my way of trying to connect with you I think that if you are uh, somebody that's cynically using it and maybe calling it a really stupid name that's a little bit racist. I think then that way you you it 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 turns from connection into cynicism and exploitation. And I think that you know there's just been a lot of essentially uh, mostly white male chefs who decide that they're going to open a restaurant. There was another one advertised the other day and inevitably they say they've travelled to Asia, they've loved the food, they've come home, they want to do it, they're professional chefs, etc, etc. They want to do a Kiwi twist on an old favourite, so on, so on. And so, But the problem is when they have a menu that makes puns about the Asian accent, um, there isn't an accent by the way, mm. it's all in the mind, but if, if you have that kind of thing, then I think that it really, you have to look at who they're really making it for. So there are a bunch of white guys exploiting Asian food for a white audience. That's all, that's all it is. In, in New Zealand, you've got like the, I guess what you would call like conventional junior lunches, like a sandwich. I think it's mostly always just a sandwich, but um, yeah. And sometimes my mum would give me um, rice or something else, but she'd just ask me if I'd want what was, she'd 
she asked me if we wanted to go to the that was left over from the dinner before and I I really like wouldn't want it. I feel like no, I don't want it. <laughs> but um yeah, no I didn't experience any racism, it was mostly me just being a bit anxious about um, what others might think about the type of food that I was bringing to school. Well, I think the major shift is a shift in the culture again, like you said. Um, back in Fiji, again, our normal food daily, when we take it to school, is roti wrapped with um, some curry and all in that. But when I came here, so, you know, it's like burgers, french fries. It just changed over here. And, you know, I used to stare at my friends like, why the hell are you bringing burgers and all that to school? It's meant to be roti because, you know, it's like food. Yeah. It's not like a bread that you put in your mouth and, like, you're hungry by half time. So it was just all mixed up and my friends were looking at me like weirdly, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm just trying to defend my food, you know, like, because yeah. they were looking at me weirdly when I brought um, Fijian Indian food in, like, I normally take roti to school or it's rice with curry and they used to look at me like, you really are a curry muncher, don't you think so? Yeah. And I was like, what's wrong with that? Are you one? I'm proud to be one. It's like... It's just, you know, it's not what it fits in the culture in school. It's like, I don't really care what the culture says. You know, my food is meant to please me, not the culture. Yeah, I think those feelings were inspired by an internal conflict because, because I had spent so much time in New Zealand, I kind of knew, I already had a, a clear-ish picture of what um, a New Zealand lunch would look like, being here since I was so young. So I already knew what would fit the picture and I wanted to fit in that as well. So I think those feelings about the lunches um, were also deeply into to that. And I just don't get it why people don't see the fact that, you know, that my mum, I know every morning she puts a lot of effort in getting me raw tea. She's yeah. not with me at the moment, so I do miss her food. Yeah. So it's like lots of things that I really don't understand why it's happening when it comes to Fijian Indian food for me and then there's Western food. I mean Western food is great but again the amount of effort it needs to take to make those Fijian Indian food is tremendous and I don't want to upset my mum because first of all the food is yummy itself and second of all it's just you know her way of showing love and care and warmth every day so I don't want to disappoint that at all. There is a part of me that when I think about if I regret or not about accepting my mum's lunches, her, or her proposed Filipino lunches for me. Um, there is a part of me that does feel a lot of guilt for not wanting to accept that graciousness by my mother, or that generosity, or even that aspect of the culture to be represented when I go to school and, um, you know, live out what was my normal daily life. Um, I think that it, it's hard because there's a part of me that regret is connected to a feeling of guilt, but also at the same time there is a part of me that doesn't regret it um, because I feel at the time when I was a teenager I was so anxious about what others uh, thought about me that if I did come to school with Filipino lunches I would have been um, so nervous <laughs> about what others might think. So I have saved myself from those people I don't regret um, having those types of lunches. But looking back at it now, I do feel guilty about... Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if the word would be shining, but I feel like I'm embracing that part of um, the culture into my school life, which when you're younger is a big part of um, You know, when I make um, curry that consists of turmeric powder and curry powder, my friends easily and happily eat them. Some of them are white friends. But at the same time, you know, I've got other white friends that come and say, you really are a curry muncher. And I'm like, really? Is that how it's meant to be? Um, I think that uh, experimenting with food forms, that's free for all, but I think if you label your restaurant as a faux Asian thing to make money, then I think there's something really wrong with that, and I don't, I, I don't know how to say, how to, you know, I don't think there should be a law against it, but I think it should be called out. Mm. We are trying our best to deliver the authentic food in Auckland, 
and more often you know sandringham is uh, i can say in future it will call uh, little india and i want to see that also you know i want other uh, uh, business people should you know mm. do something authentic uh, same like how we are trying so it should be like uh, you know if you go to singapore there is a little india there is a place called little india i hope one day here also in sandringham should be little india you know you when people come to the when people visit in auckland they should come here or oh, let's go to small little india and they will enjoy like they will get lot of other varieties also as family businesses by the people um who have come to you know often their immigrant families that are trying to establish themselves and this is their business and their livelihoods so if you just slap branding on it and and kind of like white person signage all around the place then what you're doing is you're actually like you're killing the golden goose you're you're doing it you're gentrifying it so in other words the rents will rise which means that the people who made the original restaurants won't be able to stay there they'll just move and then you'll get essentially fake asian restaurants run by fake white chefs who think they can cook asian food moving in and making trendy restaurants and pricing dumplings at um you know at stupid prices stupid white people prices instead of decent prices Yeah.